Brothers, impatiently, Brooke sat watching the sunset in the distance. Time always seemed to slow when he got to this point in the day. He felt like he was watching ice melt, as the sun slowly made its descent behind the hillside. He watched from his perch in the oak tree, hoping the sun would hurry up and disappear. Then, the click of the lock that was his favorite sound in the world brought his gaze to the doors of the library. The paunchy librarian had just finished her routine of locking the doors and was taking her slow. Waddling walked to the bus stop at the corner, he could make his move now, and she probably wouldn't notice him, but it just wasn't worth the risk. A little more waiting, not long now, and he would be free for the night, the squealing brakes of the bus as it slowed to a stop, probably his second favorite sound, meant that his wait was over. He watched her climb aboard the bus, the doors closed, and he was instantly moving, he scrambled up the tree, just three or four branches higher, and then took the tenuous climb out the limb that hung over the roof of the library. The first time he had tried this, nearly a year ago, he was scared out of his mind. On that night, he was sure he would fall or be caught, but the reward was worth the risk. But tonight, after making this jaunt hundreds of times, he gracefully moved along the branch and lightly dropped onto the roof. He scurried over to the exhaust vent, found the familiar bent corner, and pried it open. A bit of a shimmy down the vent shaft and he was in his sanctuary, all day, every day, Brooks had to be someone else. He was expected to work in the factory. To be tough. To do as he was told and not complain. This is what was expected of his kind. But, that's not Brooks. When he gets into the library, a place forbidden to him, he was able to let his guard down and be himself, tonight was no different. Tonight, he planned to lose himself in more stories. He had been working through the fantasy stories and he truly loved reading about the young heroes, the unexpected heroines, the kid who discovers he has powers. Or strength, or holds some secret that will change the world. At night, he was the hero. He had the power, he grabbed a few books and took them to his favorite corner, settled in, and began to read. It could have been hours or minutes, so lost in the stories Brooks was, when a sound startled him to attention, he froze as he listened for further evidence of noise. He then heard a small cough and thought he might recognize it. He gingerly began to tiptoe around the shelves until he could just barely peek past the edge. What he saw startled him, almost more than it would have been to see a librarian. Tuck, what are you doing? he said, as he emerged from behind the shelves and headed towards his brother. Tucker, or Tuck as most people called him, was his brother, younger by almost two years. Tuck was not yet old enough to be required to work, and that was a good thing, as he had always had weak lungs and trouble breathing, Tuck's face was sheepish and embarrassed as he looked into the eyes of his hero. I followed you, he said shyly before another small cough escaped, Tuck, it isn't safe for you, you could have. Brooks began to scold him but stopped short as Tuck began a small coughing fit. Come here, continued Brooks, and sit down by me. He put his arm around Tuck's shoulder and walked him to his favorite corner. Brooks sat and began reading to himself once again as Tuck caught his breath. Soon, Tuck was peering over his shoulder and began with the questions, Why do you come in here? What are you doing? Reading, came Brooks's short reply. When this didn't seem to satisfy, he paused his reading and turned to face Tuck. How did you get in here? I followed you and climbed the tree like you. That was dangerous, then after a short pause, but very brave. The grin that broke out on Tuck's face was bigger than Brooks ever saw. Tuck blurted out, can I read too? Brooks chuckled a little, I would have to teach you. Tuck's eyes bore into him. He had those kind of eyes, large and brown and pouty that you just can't say no to, why don't I read a bit to you first? And Brooks started back at the beginning of the story. Tuck nestled his head upon his big brother's shoulder and they spent the evening battling dwarves, rescuing princesses, befriending elves, and escaping dragons, as they made their way back across the branch and down the oak tree, this was even harder and scarier than the climb up, Tuck looked at his brother with longing and Brooks could see the deep desire in his heart.
If you don't tell anyone, Brooke said quietly, you can come back with me again tomorrow. Tuck's heart nearly burst with joy, causing him to lose his grip for a minute, but Brooks's quick reflexes and strong hand grabbed him before he was able to plummet and they completed their descent and headed toward. Life flatlines, screaming, pain, eventually, death. The hospital was full of patients. Some dead, some on the verge of death. In front of me was a young boy. He looked around 12 years old. There were several bruises on his forehead and arms. His leg had a sharp piece of metal sticking out of it. I winced. Several doctors were around me, also looking at the boy. We were all new and had never operated on a patient before. From the look of their faces, I could tell they have given up. There's no use, exclaimed Alex, one of the doctors. This is too much for me. I can't take it anymore, replied Angela. She headed out of the room. I don't want to see anyone die, I said. I looked at the clock. One hour until the new year. I had never really wanted to become a doctor. The sight of blood always haunts me. My mom has always told me this, being a doctor isn't a burden, it's a gift. God can't heal people, so he sent us to save lives, I have heard this many times throughout my life. The more I thought about this, the more I wanted to become a doctor. This statement has changed my life. Forever, I found myself studying medicine and biology in school. I was fascinated by the anatomy of living beings. I remember once when we were dissecting a frog, about three people threw up, all on the floor. Every time I walked home from school, I was taunted by kids calling me nerd and geek. I didn't mind nor care. I only wanted to focus on my studies. I excelled in exams and tests. Many scholarships were given to me and I was able to study in the best colleges. I felt determined. I applied for many hospitals and managed to get a job at one. The hospital I got a job at was near where I lived. I wanted to spend some time at home for a while, so I didn't go to work that day. It was a few hours before the new year, so I put on the Times Square ball drop on my TV. Crowds were gathered around the area, but I decided not to go. When I was younger, around six years old, my parents took me to the ball drop. I got lost in the scene and accidentally thought the person next to my parents was my dad. I held the stranger's hand and hugged his feet tightly. When I looked up to see my dad, my eyes widened. I quickly ran away from him and managed to get to my parents. I looked back at him one more time and saw the stranger wink at me. I quickly smiled back and hid from his view. That incident has prohibited me from entering that place during the new year. I only went there if something new was going to happen. While watching TV, a sudden boom was heard, followed by the house shaking. I got up from the couch, startled. I had no idea what was going on. I ran outside and found a couple of other neighbors on their porch, looking around the street. I examined the house and saw that no damage was made. I also talked with a few of my neighbors. They also heard the boom. I quickly went inside and changed the channel to the local news. The reporter was talking about a large explosion a few streets away, which was caused by a gas pipe leak. The next scene showed the hospital flooded with patients. Some looking not dead, barely dead, quite dead, and very dead. As a doctor, the pain looked scary to me. As I was looking at the TV, my phone started to ring. I picked it up. Hello, I asked. Yes, we are asking you to please come to the hospital. A recent explosion on Rockingham Boulevard caused a surge of patients to arrive at our center. Again, we please ask you to help out, replied the person on the other end. And with that, the call disconnected. I rushed into my car and sped off toward the hospital. Traffic was slow. There were many ambulances and lots of other cars, which I guess are the patient's family members. I arrived at the hospital in distress. I never thought that my first day of work would be a big one. I went to the reception and showed my ID badge to her. After taking a quick inspection, she looked down at a piece of paper held by a clipboard. She then scanned the board to find my name. After finding it, she told me the room number I was supposed to head to. I bounded across the hallway. All around me were weeping families and patients in bed. After a few minutes of searching, I finally found the room. I opened the door to find several other doctors inside and a boy. He had bruises everywhere, and a sharp piece of metal sticking out of his leg. It was just me, Alex, and Sam, another doctor, remaining in the room, along with the boy. 
We tried all we could but never could fix the bruises nor the metal piece. I turned around to Sam. How much longer do we have left? I asked. He might be gone by midnight, he replied. I felt hopeless. All the efforts we did produce only one result, failure. We didn't want to take the agony of the treatment anymore, so we stopped. There was no use anymore. My friends wanted to stick with the boy, wanting him to get up again. I decided to head to my parents' house, which was...